going to ask um, each of our panelists to uh, spend uh, 10 or 12 minutes uh, extracting the uh, key points, the lessons from our conversation last night uh, with Paul Martin and our conversations uh, from this morning. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, First of all, uh, let me thank uh, everyone who has gone before. And uh, speaking for myself, I don't pretend to be able to um, extrapolate and identify all the good points that people have said uh, uh, this morning and last evening. Um, I have just a series of what I might call random thoughts from what I have heard and my own thoughts. And uh, uh, we can discuss this, any or none of them uh, at the end. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge the work of Samara. Some of you uh, heard, I think, Jennifer refer to Samara or Samara. And uh, I think it's a really interesting initiative. And uh, I don't know, Max, whether you have information or whether we've made the reports available. It's a series of four reports. And they were exit interviews done with 65 members of parliament who had left parliament. And I was one of the 65. I, I must say, I, I thought it was an interesting experience. It was a detailed experience, qualitative primarily. Um, but I would recommend the reports to all of you. And actually, coming out of that, Samara is going to do an annual democracy index. And it's not clear to me exactly what the metrics will be. But they do talk about that at the end of their fourth and final su uh, summary report. And I actually think this potentially can be a good initiative for our country, depending upon the men benchmarks and, and how they do their work. But uh, I think exit interviews, I think they were revealing, if you look at what MP said. I'm not going to repeat what Jennifer said. But two things that I do believe are, are very important here. One, they identified not the nomination process as opaque, ambiguous, um, choose your language, something that they had very little familiarity with or comfort with. Um, secondly, they identified their own political parties as the biggest barrier to their empowerment as members of parliament. Think about that, ladies and gentlemen. Their own party was identified over and over again as the reason they could, in their opinion, not do the job they believed that they were sent to Ottawa to do um, on the part of their constituents. Now, if that's the case, then how do we change political parties? If they're the problem, how do we change them? And honestly, I, I do not think there's a magic bullet here, and I do not think change is going to come easily, and Rick will probably have more to say about this uh, than me. But I think to have any chance of changing our political parties, it will require a moment in time when we have exceptionally courageous leadership in our political parties who recognize that they are and how they function part of the problem. And I think it will also require tremendous trust among those political leaders to actually say, you know, the problem's not the conservatives, the problem's not the liberals or the new democrats, the problem is all of us. And we should take to heart the kinds of things MPs from all parties are saying in the Samara reports and elsewhere because our country deserves better and our country is poorer if we're not able to do better. But I, don't, I am not naive, Mike Harcourt has left, so I guess he won't be calling me naive, but I am not naive about this. I think that in fact our political parties will probably only meaningfully change when the public gets involved and says enough is enough. Our politics is not what we want. Uh, we are not getting either the process or the outcomes that we need as a complex country in a difficult global circumstance. And I am one of those who believes that we as citizens get the government and the politics we deserve. And therefore, if we don't stand up, I don't think it's going to be easy to encourage or incentivize our political parties to change. But I do believe we have to seriously start to look, each of us who's a member of a party, but we as citizens, what is it we expect of our political parties? And if they're not delivering it, what can we do as citizens to change that process? Um, 
We've heard about women in politics. I'm not going to go over this again. I do, however, believe that our politics and therefore our political parties, again, must represent in a meaningful way the country that they claim to be part of. And therefore, we need more women. We need more ethnic representation. We need more urban representation. Difficult issue, actually. Um, but again, unless our our system of democracy actually represents how we live our lives day in, day out in our communities, in our families, on the streets. No wonder people are cynical and feel disengaged from that process. So we really do need to work a lot harder, um, both as citizens and political parties, to ensure that we are nominating people who look like our communities and our workplaces and that we're supporting them and uh, we have that what I consider a vibrancy in our democracy that comes from representing the lived reality of our lives. Now, just one other thing in terms of women in politics. They did identify for me three major concerns. But let me just say something about the culture of politics, which women identified as, as off-putting to them. Rick, you said that we need to clean up the workplace, that being parliament, I think, and the way government and opposition parties do their business. I couldn't agree more. You also invoked Obama, and President Obama, and the fact that he has taken a higher road approach to his opponents and discussion of the issues. I agree with that entirely. I find it refreshing to listen to President Obama talk uh, about substance and his uh, opponents without name calling and so on. But as I mentioned to Rick, you know, where's the incentive for Obama to do that? In fact, his biggest critics are within his own party, the Democratic Party. They criticize President Obama for not being tough enough, for cutting the Republicans too much slack. He needs to get his elbows up and practice what I would call the more traditional old boys form of politics. And I find it interesting that there, there are no incentives, unfortunately, or apparently very few, in our own political parties, and dare I say civil society, for being civil and treating your opponents with respect and as an important part of the democratic process. Um, just one example here, and it's a great example that I love. Preston Manning, when he, he and I were elected together in 1993, and I was Minister of Energy, and Preston um, was going to ask me a question, my very first question in the House of Commons. And Preston and I both come from Alberta, the whole question of a carbon tax was, you know, bubbling along out there. So Preston called me in the morning before question period and said, Anne, I want you to know I'm going to ask, ask you this question and I want you to be prepared. And I said, thank you very much, and got prepared, I was ready for the question, and I thanked Preston for that. I thought, you know what? That's the way this should operate. You, get pre you know what the question is, you get prepared, you give an answer of substance. Preston and I have talked about this often. He said, you know, Anne, we did that in the Reform Party for about six months. And all I got was criticism from the media and from my own caucus members who said, we're not getting any credit for this. People think we don't understand the system. They think we're naive. We've got to change what we're doing. We're not getting that uh, sound bite on the 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock news. So the Reform Party changed how they did question period, and they went back to the way everybody had been doing it for quite some time, not forever, but for quite some time. But there's a great example of we need to get the incentives flowing the right way. We need to incentivize the Preston Mannings who actually think question period could be something meaningful and informative and help Canadians understand more about the big issues of the day. Um, I, am I... Oh, okay, well, at least in terms of time. Um, <laughs> all, all the way around. Impound what is the appropriate thing uh, No, to no, say? nothing, right. nothing there. You just let that one go, Rick. Um, now, we have talked about uh, the lack of empowerment or the lack of felt empowerment on the part of members of parliament. Um, I, again, I, we talked about the political party. Things you can do, I think, in the House and the rules of the House, and, but again, they go back to parties and leadership. 
do. Free your votes. Paul Martin talked about this last night. I think that we can have more free votes um, where, in fact, the government will lose a vote and the media doesn't say the government's out of control, it can't deliver on its agenda, the opposition doesn't crow, look what we just did, but that everybody's mature and says it's a free vote. People in all parties, including the government party, voted the way they felt made most sense for either them or their constituents. So I think more free votes that are truly free but that will require a cultural change in political parties. Committees, we need better resource committees like the US uh, congressional system where in fact people have the resources to do good detailed work, uh, call lots of witnesses if that's what's required, um, and you need less control from PMO in relation to, or leaders of opposition parties in terms of who gets appointed chair, who gets to serve on the committee, how long they get to serve on the committee, and so on. And this was another issue identified in the Samara reports, that people felt some of their best work was done in committee, but they didn't like this op oppressive sense of control that they would be pulled back or replaced on the committee if, in fact, they weren't doing either their parties bidding or the government's bidding. Having said that, you can't have committees that are in chaos, uh, and that would be, I think, Mike uh, Harcourt's point to some extent. But, and, and there I will say that at the end of the day, politics is, right now, our politics is premised upon the political party. That is not going to change anytime soon, as far as I can tell. Political parties are teams, and this is something people don't understand. A team has, for lack of a better analogy, a jersey. It has a tagline. It has a, a slogan. Well, political parties have brands and they have platforms from which the brand hopefully flows. Um, and you know what? It's a good thing that we have political parties that are teams with platforms. Rick and I can decide. We can look at what the various parties are saying and we can say, I like that team better than this team and I want to play for that team. But people should not be naive about the fact that political parties do matter, they need to be reformed. They do matter, they are teams, they stand for a set of values and, and substantive public policy outcomes and we need people to articulate that and then people can make a choice in terms of which team they want to play on. And yes, people sometimes cross the floor because they decided they got on the wrong team. And I think that there are some important democratic issues involved with floor crossing. But, I mean, don't be surprised that every now and then someone discovers unwittingly and with no bad faith that they're on the wrong team. And then it becomes a case of how you actually deal with that question. The last thing I have to say is this big question that's been floating out there. Who is a good person? You know, and do, uh, wh how, what we get, how we get more, in brackets, good people. Well, what does good mean? Somebody asked that question last night, and I thought, you know, that, that is such an important question, and it is not a question of easy answer. Um, good may be like beauty in the eye of the beholder or the constituent or the voter. But for me, and it doesn't matter, it has nothing to do with ideology. I think for me right now, a good person in, on whatever team they may choose to participate is a person who handles complexity well. Someone who understands most issues in our communities, our families, our nation, our world are not straight lines and feels comfortable working in an environment or a milieu, at least at the national level, day in, day out, with highly complex issues. I think that person has to have a finely tuned cultural awareness today in terms of the diversity of our country and the, the pressures on um, being such a diverse country and how we ensure we continue to be a peaceful uh, country with that diversity. And the person has to understand the global situation in which we find ourselves. And ladies and gentlemen, you find people with those characteristics in all the political parties we have. And you find people without them in all the political parties we have. That to me and it's only my view, and you all have your own characteristics. That, to me, defines 
the good for me. That's the kind of person I would like to see more of standing for elected office. And I would like to think that more of us would reward those people with those characteristics, because at least in my opinion, that's what's going to be required to govern this nation going forward. Thank you, Anne. Rick. Am I allowed to just say I don't have anything to add? Uh, <laughs> uh, if, if you can make that last 10 minutes. <laughs> well, OK. You know, I, um, I agree with, uh, I think, almost everything, or maybe even everything that Anne just said, which uh, uh, is not a first for us, um, although uh, our partisan paths have caused us to, of course, pretend to be uh, antagonistic to each other, yeah, because that's what's that's expected true. in that's, that game. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, let me start. You know, I think, first of all, this has been a terrific uh, 24 hours, uh, terrific uh, comments from a lot of people, uh, and a very important topic. And I think what's most important about this is that we uh, understand this to be a way station on a trip. Uh, and uh, we have to figure out what the ultimate destination is and, and what other way stations there may be. But I really hope that, we, that what you're doing here, what the center's doing here, uh, what all of us are doing here continues because there are too few places in this country where we spend time seriously talking about this. What is this? Uh, for me, it's about good governance, you know, at the end of the day. It's about making democracy work. It's about engaging people. Uh, and, uh, you know, we can kind of make that sound corny if we want. But if you look around the world right now, <clears throat> the problems are not just the problems that we're all used to in emerging democracies and dictatorships and so on. The problems are in democracies. Uh, and, you know, you, it's, I don't think it's too big a question to ask ourselves, are we running into our modern limits to how effective democracy is as a method of governing ourselves? I'm not saying that because I want to go to the alternatives. But, you know, the United States in the last decade has borrowed a trillion dollars from China uh, and put itself, I think, in a very difficult position long term. Uh, you know, it's not just Greece. It's not just Italy. It's a whole rack. I mean, Portugal's debt was yesterday downgraded to junk category. You know, Hungary, same thing. Uh, these are, Hungary's not been a democracy for a particularly long time, but, but there's a, an ill in democracy where, you know, if you want to kind of think about it in partisan terms, the conservatives all kind of want to cut taxes without necessarily wanting to cut the spending because that's kind of a bad news story. <clears throat> Cutting taxes is popular. Liberals or progressives, if you will, like to spend money on social programs and other kinds of programs and don't necessarily want to raise taxes because that's kind of a bad, bad news story and gets you in trouble with the voters. And so we got these two tendencies that are pushing in opposite directions and the hole between them is called the deficit. Uh, and uh, we're repeating that year after year after year and country after country after country and you kind of look at the news coverage of that and you look at the parliamentary debate about it, debates about it, and they don't reflect the severity of the problem. Uh, and I, you know, if I could encourage you to read one thing that I th it keeps going through my mind when I think about these things, it's that Neil Postman book from 20-odd uh, years ago, uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death, <clears throat> which is prescient. Uh, he was talking about the emergence of uh, news media, or the transformation of news media as an entertainment vehicle. And if you look at what's going on in all of our news media that are dedicated to politics, that's what's happened. The flamethrowers, the name callers, the, the people with something controversial to say get all the attention. The people who are slugging it out there doing the hard work <clears throat> in the committees or elsewhere get no attention or almost no attention. Uh, and <clears throat> we have to figure out how to write this balance and we have to figure out, I think, how to have an intelligent discussion uh, that isn't just about, you know, constitutional balance, budget amendments and stuff like that, but actually gets the idea of whatever amount of government, whatever type of government you choose to have, we choose to have, we also have to figure out how to pay for it. And that's not just about borrowing the money from somebody. And, you know, yes, cycles and everything else, recessions, and, you know, it's not perfect and so on, but you can't go year after year after year after year uh, borrowing and borrowing and borrowing and telling yourselves that we don't have to actually pay for this because you become Greece at the end of that exercise. And we don't want Canada. Canada's not particularly on that road. But our politics kind of are not that different. The Americans are on that road. Uh, and they need to get off it soon. 
um, you know, the failure of the super committee this week and so on. So go back to our topic here, it's about good governance. I think to answer the question of the, uh, of the conference, why don't more good people, as other people have said, there are plenty of good people who do go into politics. There are too many who shy away from it. That's a problem. Uh, but I also think a problem is good people who go into politics become disenchanted. They become frustrated. Uh, they leave sometimes. Uh, or, even more sadly, they get pounded into behaving in a certain way, which isn't actually the way they wanted to be when they went, before they went into politics. You know, your story about Preston is, is illustrative. You know, he wanted to do things differently. You may recall he sat in the second row of the House of Commons. You know, people laughed at him for that. But he was trying to send a message. It's not all about the leader. You know, that's not a message that people wanted to hear or they didn't respect it, including within his own caucus. You know, I remember when uh, Paul Martin brought in, as finance minister, brought in his first budget. I think it was the 95 budget, which made a serious dent in what was a humongous uh, federal government deficit. And the Reform Party's response to that, Stephen Harper was our finance uh, critic, was that's a pretty good budget. We don't have a whole lot of criticism about it. You know, we wish he would have done it last year instead of waited an extra year. It was something like that. Yeah. Well, there was a brouhaha within the caucus over that. Oh, you can't be congratulating the, uh, the government. You can't be saying they're doing anything right. We're here to tear their faces off. You know, and this is the way we have come to understand the way government should work. And, you know, it causes people um, <clears throat> Anne talked about floor crossing. I have never been elected um, for some of the reasons that we've talked. Maybe I, I couldn't be elected, uh, but I've never even tried for some of the reasons that we're talking about here. But I have done the backroom clock crossing, not a floor crossing. And I did it because of democratic reform issues, of fiscal responsibility issues, and so on. But I'll tell you the truth of that is either before or since. I've never belonged to a political party on which I agreed 100%, with which I agreed 100% of the time. There is no such beast. But, but day after day after day, partisans are expected to go out and pretend otherwise. The other folks are always wrong, we're always right. The other folks are all uh, here for the wrong reasons, we're all good people here for the right reasons. These things are not true. And the beginning of a deceptive kind of approach to politics, if I can put it that way, starts in that partisan caucus mentality of we have to always, we can't acknowledge the other people have anything to say. You know? And I mentioned earlier in the previous session, I think we've gotten off the rails in understanding or failing to understand the purpose of par Parliament, which is not to pass the government's legislation or even to pass the government's budgets. It's to decide what they should be. You know, and people regularly, when we talk about institutional fixes, we talk about freer votes, but we always quickly add, well, not on budgets, of course. Well, why, of course? You know, on a $250 billion budget, is it not okay for Parliament to say, we'd rather spend... $248 billion, and we don't want this particular $3 billion, or we'd like to add something over here, or we'd like to shift $2 billion from this pot to that pot. Is that really a confidence measure? Should, the gov should, the, should a government fall over that? I know this is a radical proposition, but isn't that kind of the basic idea of Parliament, that it's supposed to control the raising of taxes and the spending of money? That is the original premise. And what we have gotten ourselves into is this idea that Parliament is supposed to largely do the government's bidding. Not the opposition side, they're supposed to oppose. Uh, the government, but the, uh, the government side is supposed to do what the government, the ministry, expects it to do. And, you know, as Gordon was referring to earlier, there's a whole bunch of career incentives that uh, are used to control that, uh, and there's punitive things and so on. You can be put right outside caucus if you don't agree. Uh, you can lose your cabinet seat, et cetera, et cetera. But, and, so, and these things are highly effective, and they encourage a very high degree of, of uh, discipline. And, you know, I don't think it's an accident that the two leaders, two of the leaders who were here with us last night and today, um, Prime Minister Martin and Premier Harcourt, both tended to see this as not such a big problem. Uh, you know, and, and from their perspective, it probably isn't or wasn't, but it is a problem. Uh, you know, they should... You regularly hear in Canadian politics that if we go down this road of greater, more freer votes, greater parliamentary, uh, parliamentary independence, um, that we'll end up with that horrible U.S.-style thing called gridlock, 
Well, gr gridlock, of course, you hear about it all the time when it's happening and then it gets resolved and you stop hearing that they solved the gridlock problem, right? So it seems like it's a perpetual problem, but it's usually not. You know, they pass legislation pretty routinely in the Congress and, uh, and they figure out how to, you know, between the House of Representatives and the Senate and the White House to go into conference and rationalize things and argy bargy and end up with something that more people will support. That's what they normally do. We see the gridlock and we Canadians go to efficiency. We say, well, you know, we don't want that. We need to have efficiency in government. We need to be able to pass our budget quickly. Well, why is that? Is this a speed test or are we trying to get it right? Uh, and we get our, our focus on the wrong sorts of things. So I, I think to, you know, when I listen to the discussion that we've had over the last day or so, uh, I, I think first you have to start with the theory. What is the role of parliament? What is the role of our legislatures? Um, what is, the, uh, what is our, to, to use Sam Sullivan's term, which is not a term we think about enough in Canada, what is the idea of separation of powers that we actually have here? In the American system, that's all clarified, it's written down, these guys do this, these guys do that, you can't do this without getting those people's permission, blah, blah, blah. In the British system, it's largely unwritten, it's by convention and tradition, but it's, we've wandered into a place where the, the so-called conventions have become very leader-friendly, very PM-friendly, uh, and we've kind of lost some of the conventions that used to operate the other way. So let's maybe start with having a discussion about how to reinvent some idea of what the role of parliament versus the ministry is. Uh, and then we can do what Samara is talking about, which is to figure out how to train people properly to do that job. You can't just have a training program, which they're correct to say, wouldn't it be nice if parliamentarians knew better what was expected of them and how to go about being good at it. You can't do that unless you know what the job description actually is. And the job description isn't for the individual, it's for the institution. And so we have to, I think, step back and ask ourselves some serious questions and then construct the kind of training program that flows from the Samara study. I mean, it's really quite awesome to think about 65 MPs who just recently have left the, the federal parliament painting such a dismal picture of what it was like. You really should read that if you haven't looked at it. I know there's four different reports and I many hundreds of pages. Um, the last two, I think, are the most profound of it, uh, but the first two are important because they also talk about the nomination process and so on that we're talking about here today. But they all paint this picture of a highly centralized, le leader-dominated uh, political institution, the federal parliament, where the individual MPs uh, not only don't really know how to do their job, they're not even really clear what it is, uh, and you almost get the sense that somebody likes it that way. I'm not a big conspiracy theorist, but it, you know, it kind of suits the executive, meaning the prime minister and the cabinet, that MPs kind of swirl around and aren't really sure, you know, if they, should I just do, have hearings and have witnesses, or are we actually supposed to take clause whatever it is of the bill <clears throat> and rewrite it? Well, of course that's what they're supposed to do. That's what parliament does. So you're, first of all, lawmakers. Figure out how to make laws and, and start developing the courage to actually not just put a rubber stamp on them. Um, so a lot of things flow from those kinds of ideas, you know, freer votes in Parliament. How far we go on that? You know, we'll of course have the usual Canadian discussion. We'll assume that we'll go to the extreme and that things will stop working, we'll become an anarchist uh, society. Uh, you know, we're unlikely to actually end up there. Uh, so let's at least start thinking about what we should do and how we could maybe liberate MPs a little bit. Uh, the idea that several people referred to it, Anne was referring to it a second ago, parliamentary committees. I bet most of you don't know that parliamentarians don't get to decide who's on the committees. They don't get to decide which committee they serve on. The leader does that. The whip does it, but the leader does it. The whip does it on the leader's behalf. And if they don't like what you're doing there, you're not on that committee tomorrow. Just like that. It's as, and it, it happens all the time. And the MPs who are on these committees know that. So they operate within a fairly narrow bandwidth. I agree with what Don Black was saying here, which is a lot of the most important work of Parliament does occur in those committees. And there's a lot more potential that could be tapped. I mean, there's, they have a, spend a lot more time in committees on legislation than Parliament does uh, in a more substantive way. But they're not basically allowed. The government considers it a front if the opposition tries to amend its legislation, and they consider it a capital offense if their own members try to, to amend the legislation. So. Uh, you, you know, you've got this kind of important work going on, but where the understanding from the top is, you know, you can have hearings as long as you want, as long as at the end of the day you give us back our bill. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that's, so there's things that can be done there to 
put back in the hands of Parliament the choosing of committee members and the choosing of the committee chairs, and flowing from that would be the de determination of the agendas of parliamentary committees and so on. And if you made that change coupled with freer votes on more issues, I mean, Paul Martin talked about the three-line whips and so on. Uh, he didn't get enough time to really do much with that. Par you know, one of the things we've, I think, probably all observed is that in opposition, all of our parties, the NDP, the Greens, the Liberals, the Conservatives, Reform, uh, they tend to be pretty good at thinking about the kinds of things that should be reformed. In government, they almost never have the time to do them. Yeah. You know, um, Maybe that's a coincidence, except it happens over and over again. Uh, and, uh, and so you've got to be a little bit cynical about that. And I think we've got to start holding people's feet to the fire, that when we talk about these things, when we cross party lines, and you know, <clears throat> the agreement is, that we're actually going to do them, and we're going to support each other in doing them rather than make, obstructing each other and pointing out the flaws because there's, you know, the Senate debate is famous for this. I mean, elect it, reform it, abolish it, do one or the other, but we log jam each other and we don't do either, and we have this house. Gordon and I don't agree on this, so I, I'll, I'll be brief on this thing. Maybe I'll just stop right now or it'll stand <laughs> up here. And Anyway, uh, so I think, first of all, Fix the theory. What is the point of this, and how is it supposed to work? Secondly, uh, address the culture. Uh, how, does it, how do we actually move the rewards and punishments around to the right kinds of things? You know, I, one of the things that really um, surprises me in the media coverage and the parliamentary collegial uh, treatment of uh, parliamentary treatment of colleagues is the way anybody who dares to take an independent approach is treated. You would think that the media would gravitate towards those people and start to, you know, showcase them as a little bit more courageous than others, a little bit more freer thinking, a little bit more independent minded. But instead, a, a different psychology clicks in around the parties and around the hill and around the gallery that these people are nut bars. And, and you know, the media all go to the relevant caucus room on the Wednesday morning and they line up outside there and they got one question for the leader and the house leader and the chair of that caucus, which is, should, are you going to kick this person out of the caucus? Because they've dared to say something that isn't the orthodoxy of your party. And why would that be the first, you know, why wouldn't the question be, aren't they making sense? Are you listening to them? As opposed to, are you going to punish them? So we've got this kind of reflex uh, that, that plays itself out in a lot of different dimensions in the media, around parliament and so on. People say so to me sometimes, are you going to run? And I, I've developed this answer, which is, of course, a bit of an evasion, because I don't really want to do that with my life. But I, I, I'm tempted, tempted every now and then. And I've sort of come up with this answer, which is I'll run when 50 other people run at the same time. And I don't care whether they're left wing or right wing or this party or that party, but that our common agreement is that we will support each other when we break with our party line, that we will say that's the way so people should be doing this, whether or not they agree with you. That's not the price of this. I mean, and, uh, Mike Harcourt said, uh, par politics is about partisanship, it's about values. I agree with him about the second part of that, but I don't agree with him about the first part, which is not to say we should abolish the parties. Of course, parties you know, create election platforms and raise money and do essential things and so on, recruit people, but they've become vehicles for obstructing critical thinking. And we need to end that part of their function by replacing it with more independence of thought and a system of rewards and incentives and so on that encourages people to show some independence and to speak out and to chart a path that's not exactly as the leader of your party, while not being outright disloyal, it's not exactly what the leader of your party would wish it to be. I guess I should end there, uh, other than to repeat what I said at the beginning, which is I hope that this is the... Uh, the, uh, the beginning or the early part of a process that will continue and, and actually lead to some success on the things we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have five more minutes? Uh, thanks so much. Uh, I want to put to both of you a um, somewhat dark question that you've uh, partly answered. Uh, it was suggested in a positive way by uh, Mike Harcourt this morning so that you will get good people going into politics uh, if they uh, can uh, do good things uh, with uh, inequality, poverty, the environment, uh, and so on. Uh, Winnie, this morning, uh, 
took a, a, a negative view of that and said uh, there are far too many campaigns where there are no issues on the table. Why should people be interested? Uh, the corollary to that from the standpoint of recruitment is why should people go into politics if uh, there are no good things that they believe they can do? Now, here's the, the dark proposition, which I hope you will argue vociferously against. Uh, and, and it's a structural question having to do with social evolution. Uh, there was a period in the history of Western democracies where governments were, um, in effect, high modernist planners. They could do a lot. They could create uh, Medicare and Social Security and, and so on and so forth. We now live in societies that are more plural, more diverse, more gridlocked. Uh, centers of decision have moved out and away, perhaps, from states and governments, uh, leaving governments in the position of being kind of chief negotiators at best. So if that's, you don't need to accept this premise, but if that's the proposition, um, why would we think that good people would still go into politics if there are fewer chances to do big things? We have to accept the premise? No. No. I'm uh, asking you to argue against it. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> but the, the, what's behind this in part is, of course, uh, you know, uh, 30 years of gridlock in the United States. Uh, we, we've uh, got our own know, gridlock. Several, so. several campaigns in Canada where there have been no issues on the table uh, and so on. Uh, it's not very attractive if you are, say, a young people a young person uh, wanting to know how you're going to make a difference. I mean, I, I've, I'm betraying my age, I suppose, but uh, you know, one of the first campaigns, the first campaign I was involved in was the 1974 campaign. I was a Trudeau liberal. Uh, and uh, that was the campaign, you may recall, where he made huge fun of Robert Stanfield for 60 days uh, with the zap you're frozen yeah. uh, criticism of the Tories, the Conservatives' uh, wage and price controls um, yeah. campaign platform. And then he brought in wage and price controls within a year. His finance minister quit over it. Or actually, I guess he never really said what he quit over. But um, he quit uh, rather than bring that in. Uh, you know, um, I would say in Canada, we've got gridlock on political gridlock on health care reform, uh, that we've got political gridlock on, uh, on our relationship with Aboriginal peoples. Uh, you know, we all know this is probably the country's greatest shame, longest running shame. And um, we put it off, for the most part, into long-running processes that uh, it's quite okay if they don't result in, in resolution. I mean, uh, things are changing a little bit in the last five or ten years. That's good news. Um, but, you know, we should not congratulate ourselves on being necessarily hugely more efficient than, than the Americans in addressing some of these complicated issues. And I, I, I attribute that to um, modern politics, modern modern parties have become basically campaign vehicles uh, in their instincts, and they divide issues, we divide issues, into two sorts. The ones we call swords and the ones we call shields. And uh, immediately we all kind of get in the partisan context the difference between these. A sword is something we pick up and, and use to hurt our opponents with. Uh, and so, you know, you're for higher taxes, and your party's for higher taxes, so Every time you say something, I'm going to say, well, she's just a tax and span liberal. You know, and shields are the ones where we're going to play defense because we're vulnerable, you know, so the conservatives aren't perceived to be necessarily the people to deal with, uh, with health care reform. Caring and compassion. There, see? see, she's doing it. That's her sword. That's my shield. So right. I <laughs> we should play that out so they see it in real so, time. So this, this is, you know, I mean, there's a certain reality to this, uh, but really it doesn't help us do what we actually need to do, which is to improve governance. Because we actually have to figure out taxes. We actually have to figure out budgets. We actually have to figure out health care reform. And we can't just beat each other up and go back and forth. Leaders' debates on Canadian television are, are, are huge exercises in swords and shields. And you watch what's going on in the States right now with these GOP primary debates, I find they're far more refreshing. Freer form, more substantive, more honest exchanges and so on. There's still a lot of sorting and shielding going on. There's no question about that. But, you know, they've had now 10 of them. You know, so they've spent 20 or 30 hours debating each other. And we're getting to know these candidates pretty well. And we're getting to know their strengths and weaknesses. We have a showcase here where one English, one French, huge stakes for the leaders. You make a mistake, you know, your future is gone. You know, Kim Campbell, Lucien Bouchard, you, Michael Madame, Ignatieff. Michael Ignatieff. 
you know, I mean, we have these, and they're hugely high risk because we do them only once, so everybody retreats to the safest possible ground, and we don't actually discuss the issues. And the last word. Okay, just uh, first of all, I've run four in four election, five election campaigns, and I have never been part of an issue-less campaign. I think it depends what you mean by that. Uh, the media may decide uh, through some preordained uh, right that they think the campaign is not talking about the issues they view as important. But when I go door to door in my riding or campaign across the country for others, there are lots of issues, both small and big issues. So. And if you look at the big issues, in 93, it was deficit and debt in our Red Book, you'll remember. We talked about having to deal with the deficit and the debt. We set benchmarks. We talked about climate change in the 93 Red Book and signing on to a 1990 level, which is still controversial and, and people are still debating. Um, in 97, the campaign was about if we, we've eliminated the deficit, the debt's on a downward track, how do we reinvest to increase productivity, a word people don't like, I realize it's, it's not a sexy word, but our competitiveness, how we create prosperity, investing in our post-secondary institutions, uh, and so on, um, a science and innovation agenda. Maybe those were the wrong issues, but they weren't issueless campaigns, and uh, some of them were workmanlike, some of them were more transcendent. But they were things that we believed, at least as the party who was the government at the time going into that election, that these were important things that we needed to engage Canadians in and about. The environment, foreign affairs, our role in the world, which is something Mr. Kretchen and Mr. Martin both talked a lot about, and both would say it never gets you any votes, but it's important to talk about that role for our country, because we do believe it's something that Canadians value. So. I, I guess I'm always a little uh, chary, is that the right word? When people say campaigns are issue less, from whose perspective? And, and what? Uh, let's look at it from the point of view of the leader, the party, the person going door to door in their riding, the media. What does that mean? Because I, I actually don't believe campaigns are issue less. Sometimes they're more workmanlike than other times, simply because we believe force of circumstance requires a more workmanlike uh, agenda that we put before the country, as opposed to, you know, the creation of a new program like Medicare with Lester Pearson and others in, in the 60s, or Social Security. Those weren't workmanlike issues. Those were transcendent issues that helped transform a country. Um, so, I guess uh, if, if we have the wrong issues, if I, I do believe, however, there is an important question around uh, as we talk about the issues, and maybe Paul got, touched on this last night when he talked about in response to a question about young people, and he believes when he goes out and talks to young people in universities, there's no lack of passion, right? They identify the issues that matter to them and they're fully engaged in them. I do say that political parties and those who want to be elected probably ignore that passion at our peril because I, uh, those young people are identifying the things that energize them which they see as important to their citizenship and the values they want their country to represent. We should actually, as politicians and parties, ensure that we're listening intently to that and that our campaigns are about those things. Thank you. Uh, please join me in uh, thanking our panelists for a wonderful wrap-up.